audience, welcome to our discussion uh, on the future of China's presence in Central and Eastern Europe after Russia's invasion in Ukraine, connectivity interrupted. Now, for a short welcome, we turn to the director of the Latvian Institute of International Affairs, Professor Karl Bukowski. Karl, please. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends uh, who are watching us. Uh, thank you for uh, for joining in to the online discussion. Connectivity interrupted, and let's see what's the China's presence in the Central and Eastern Europe after after uh, Russia's Russia's continued invasion in Ukraine. This is an event organized by the Latvian Institute of National Affairs, together with our longstanding partners, the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation in the Baltic States, and in cooperation with the um, International Center for uh, Policy Studies uh, from, from, from Ukraine. Um, a little bit to kick off the uh, kick off the discussion, I believe uh, a couple of words. Uh, China is a factor to be reckoned with, right? Well, maybe uh, not in the not 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 only in the in the in the region or in the Eastern Asian uh, or or Indo Pacific, but it says this is this is an issue that uh, has become very very uh, present. Uh, China's position, China's take on issues has been has become very very present in many diplomatic uh, diplomatic discussions, and so maybe. For countries like the Baltic states or some other Central and Eastern European countries, uh, China is still seen as somewhat exotic country because it's literally on the other side of the globe. But uh, China's economic, diplomatic, and also security-related reach is, as we have uh, observed multiple times already, is much wider than we used to. To some extent, China China has the capacity to. If I may use the phrase uh, squeeze the West out of the many places in the world where uh, West used to dominate, being at, in Latin America or in Africa or many, many other places, including also in some cases in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And um, I believe this is this is this this would be a very timely and important discussion uh, that uh, we're going to have today. And I will pass the floor uh, on to uh, Dr. Rona Alexander Berzin Cherenkova, who is the head of the Asia program at the Latvian International Affairs, and she has two great discussions today, Dr. Kapitonenko and Dr. Meyer, to uh, to discuss. Um, these, uh, this, this, this role of China in the Central and Eastern Europe. So I wish you all the best of luck, and I am with great interest uh, going to be listening in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carly. And indeed, you are absolutely right with with giving kind of this this uh, framework for our discussion today because we've experienced quite a curve. Um, in, in with China's presence, and or perhaps some would say uh, a full circle, because from the early 2010s, 2010s on, China became suddenly visible in our region of Europe um, and in Europe as a whole with its connectivity cooperation agenda. It was something that, that got us all kind of rolling. And um, according to that narrative, Central and Eastern Europe, in a wider sense, as China sees it, right, because Central and Eastern Europe, of course, is a contested, um, contested, um, topic in contested region, but the way China framed it, this region held a key role in the narrative surrounding China-led Eurasian economic connections. And of course, most visibly, we talk about Belt and Road, but there were also others, um, including the connectivity aspect to the 16 plus 1 cooperation, for example. However, gradually, these hopes began to decrease. Um, and the risks started coming to the forefront, especially in the EU member states. And another very important and, 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 and indeed a watershed moment was Russia's invasion into Ukraine on February 24, uh, almost a year ago. And now, given the central role of Ukraine that China had had presented in its outlooks for, for Belt and Road and for connectivity, and given China's ambiguous or sometimes even pro-Russian position um, in this in this regard, um, it seems that even less options remain now for China's presence in Central and Eastern Europe. However, this is an open question. So this is a, a future-oriented conversation. And we have a panel today that will discuss what to make of this decade of exchanges 
and what developments can we expect in the future. And for, that, for this task, we have two wonderful speakers. First of all, we have Dr. Maximilian Meyer, who is a junior professor of international relations and global politics of technology at University of Bonn. Uh, now, Dr. Meyer has extensive um, experience working in China. He was a professor at the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China, for several years, and also a research fellow at Jianmin University in Beijing. Um, Maximilian was a visiting uh, scholar at Harvard Kennedy School uh, Science Program, and his PhD is with the University of Bonn, where he's currently employed as well. So it's kind of a homecoming for, for you. Um, uh, Max writes on the global politics of science, innovation, and technology, China's foreign and energy policy, global energy and climate politics, as well as IR theories, something that also is um, um, bonding him with our second speaker. Um, I have to say that Max is, is, is a published writer. He's, pu he's published uh, books on uh, the global politics of science and technology, art and sovereignty in global politics, and also has edited Silk Road and China's Belt and Road related um, uh, monographs um, at Palgrave. Uh, currently, Max has a big project in Bonn. He's leading the research group on infrastructures of China's modernity and their global constitutive effects, uh, founded by the Ministry of Culture and Science of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia. That's why Max is perfectly um, uh, is, is 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 the perfect speaker for this topic. Um, Indeed, technology has a lot to do with China's connectivity, so perhaps he will tackle that. Now, our second speaker is Professor Mikola Kapitonenko, who is um, based at the Institute of International Relations of Kiev National Taras Shevchenko University. Um, and he's also a director at the Center of International Studies. Welcome, Mikola. Um, Mikola has been a visiting professor at the University of Iowa, um, and he has taught at the Diplomatic Academy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. So you also have the policy side outlook, not just the academy side outlook here. Mm, since 2015, uh, Professor Kapitonenko has been editing, co-editing uh, Ukraine Analytica. And also is a consultant to the Committee of, on Foreign Fo Policy and Interparliamentary Cooperation of the Parliament of Ukraine. Um, now, uh, the main research of Professor Kapitonenko is quite theoretical, in fact. Um, it's a conflict and security studies, as well as Ukrainian foreign policy. He has published several books on international re relations theory, international conflicts, and power in, in international politics. Now, please let me first turn to Professor Meyer for your introduction uh, to the topic. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. First of all, uh, uh, it's a great honor to be here and to have this uh, uh, conversation. <clears throat> I was asked to take a look like on, on the Chinese, the future of uh, uh, Chinese role in, in Europe and specifically in Central and Eastern uh, European countries. And I try to um, uh, develop a couple of um, ideas about that in, in, in four steps. Um, so first of all, I think generally the situation is like um, that all sides are in a way struggling to move beyond the impact of the pandemic um, and uh, more precisely the, the consequences of Chinese zero COVID policies, uh, which led to a, a reduction, maybe even a breakdown of uh, diplomatic exchanges and communications. Very few people have been going back and forth. People, people to contact was uh, reduced um, a lot. And in that, the Chinese side, the Chinese leadership um, aims to um, improve relations with Europe. It sends uh, persons to Europe, uh, politicians, and it also sending out in terms of its diplomatic rhetoric, some signals um, to European partners that uh, China wants to move on and improve uh, uh, relations. So for example, already in last year in 2022, there was um, the special representative for China um, uh, Central Eastern European uh, uh, countries cooperation, who was also used to be the ambassador to the Czech Republic, um, Hu Yujun, uh, Hua Yujun uh, was on a visit in Europe um, and with a delegation in several countries um, uh, uh, in Central Eastern Europe. We have also signals from the Chinese Vice Premier Liu He uh, during the Davos uh, meeting 
sending out in Chinese jungle positive energy, so to say, uh, to the Europeans. Um, and uh, according to media reports uh, next month, uh, while there is the Munich Security Conference, um, uh, the most important foreign uh, policy expert and foreign policy person, Wang Yi, uh, who was just recently promoted uh, to the Politburo, um, the most important um, um, most important uh, group within the Communist Party, uh, is uh, also going to uh, move, going to travel to Europe, and not just for the Munich Security Conference, but probably also to visit and to talk to uh, um, several European political leaders. So um, we have this kind of signals and this kind of increased um, uh, activities. We have also uh, somehow an attempt to shape European public opinions. Uh, um, some Chinese um, official voices were cited anonymously in media reports that they are critical about Russia and they are critical about Putin's uh, war and so forth. And some observers have concluded that this is a sort of a charm offensive um, of the Chinese government uh, in Europe uh, and towards European uh, uh, governments. Um, I think it's more an attempt to normalize relations and to get to a sort of normalization. If you want to have a very skeptical view on that, you could even say maybe, maybe it's not just normalization, it's more like a defensive move on side of the Chinese diplomacy to prevent relations with Europe um, from becoming even more frostly and even more problematic. So the normalization in, in some ways, if it's happening, will be on a much lower uh, level. It will be difficult to, uh, to achieve. Um, and the, the great problems of Chinese relations with Europe are very palpable and, and maybe most pronounced in a way with respect to Central and Eastern European countries. These relations have become bumpy already for, for many years. One of the reasons uh, is sort of the disappointments uh, in these countries, which have nothing to do with the pandemic, which already set in earlier before the pandemic, but became more accelerated during the pandemic. Um, basically, these disappointments have led to a reassessment of the role of China and the relations with China in many countries in Eastern uh, Europe. And this is not just related to, the, to uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, but it's they certainly became uh, uh, amplified by that. Just to have an, to, to name one example, Chinese propaganda and Chinese official media were amplifying uh, Russian uh, propaganda narratives. Uh, they were uh, amplifying the notion that NATO is the real culprit here and that um, uh, and that Russia, in fact, is the victim of aggression of the West and it's just defending itself. And all these kind of Russian narratives have been um, uh, not just oh, not just been overtaken by Chinese media, but are amplified in the Chinese media space and in Chinese use of social media in, in around around the world. However, that disappointment in European countries, of course, uh, is also going back to to other um, developments which are unrelated to the to the war in Ukraine. Um, most of all, you could say they are uh, sort of a consequence of the great economic expectations which have not been realized. The many Belt and Road projects which um, have not been uh, uh, coming to fruits and and um, neither the, the benefits and the expected profits uh, have been materializing, uh, nor the geopolitical concerns and fears that China might be, become a very powerful actor inside Europe, maybe even splitting um, uh, 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 the Europeans geopolitically as some observers have been uh, afraid of. So this kind of disappointment in a way uh, could be summarized perhaps as as something that we witness, and, and we are witnessing the peak China in, in Europe, um, and, and, and sort of a from there on a reduction of, of China's influence and soft power, and especially uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. I think this is a very, um, a very clear uh, observation. Therefore, I believe that China, um, if it's really seriously aims at improving or even repairing relations with Europe, in general and with uh, Eastern European countries in particular, it will be an uphill battle, it will be very uh, difficult. And, and maybe let me develop uh, in the last two or three minutes just a couple of um, reasons why I think that will be will remain very difficult, not just because of what happened in the past, but also uh, of uh, several factors which are now uh, important. So one point is that as China's influence in Europe is shrinking, 
and, and is perhaps beyond uh, beyond its peak, the the views, European views on China are becoming more and more negative across the board, it has to do with uh, Taiwan, has to do with the human rights violations in Xinjiang, has to do with the economic dependencies, uh, of course, with China's support uh, for Russia. Very few in Europe uh, still believe that China is really in a neutral position in that conflict. Um, and also with the waning hope that China is a major partner in climate change uh, policy. So the, the sort of positive side of this relationship where China was still seen as a partner, not just as a competitor or as a rival, this positive side is also um, um, progressively becoming uh, uh, becoming less relevant for, for European, for, from a European point of view. And uh, in addition, also, certainly the Chinese side tries to revive the comprehensive agreement on investment, the investment treaty between the both sides. Any revival of that would uh, have a precondition uh, and is seen as, as certainly seen as very controversial. So there's also uh, the, the chances are very slim that we move forward um, on that. We see um, the reservations against China growing in various uh, countries in, in Europe, especially also in Germany, which is working on its China strategy. It's not sure when it's going to be published, but the process in articulating and writing the strategy also already implies that German uh, official views and, and how the government is looking at China is much more uh, critical um, uh, than before. And that will certainly also impact the way in which Germany is looking at Chinese Central and Eastern European uh, uh, relations. Um, in addition, we have sort of a stronger competition against and with Chinese uh, uh, regional infrastructure projects. Um, and that's a bit referring to what Una was just mentioning. We do a lot of research here on infrastructure. So we look at these different political initiatives. We have the European Global Gateway. We have the Three Cs initiatives. We have even perhaps growing Taiwanese investment in the region. So there is now competition for the Belt and Road, while at the same time, the, um, the major format China has been promoting and China has been building with partners in Eastern Europe, the 17 plus one is basically dead in the water. It has been reduced down to a 14 plus one and it's very unlikely that this format is gonna be revived in the midterm. Long-term maybe again, but in the midterm, it's certainly uh, not much happening in that. Um, mistrust um, uh, is growing in, in Europe and um, the Russian war in Ukraine and, and uh, China's precarious uh, neutral position uh, is, is uh, really escalating that mistrust. You could even say that China's soft power in Europe has been eradicated almost completely. And this observation and the political consequences of that, I think, have not been fully internalized by Chinese elites. So there's still the kind of view that, of course, Europe is a very important economic partner and it's possible to repair the relations where I think that's actually no longer the case. Uh, European Chinese relations will remain important, but on a much lower level. And that brings me to the final, um, I think, point I want to make. So there's another factor which is very important, um, uh, which is the Chinese-US relations. And given the increased importance of the United States for Eastern Europe as a, as a defense partner and as a critical element in the, in the struggle with Russia, the US positions on China will also influence uh, increasingly so the relations between Eastern European countries um, and China. And, and it's very clear that the conflict in, in Asia Pacific will also have an impact on diplomatic uh, opportunities and, and limits what Eastern European countries can do in the future and how they will view China. So clearly the, 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 the title of this talk today, Interrupted Connectivities, I think can be uh, described not just as a diagnosis for today, but it's uh, describing the more general situation for, for years to come. And that's making it much more challenging from a U European point of view to deal with China in a post-COVID and hopefully also soon post-war environment. There are still potentials for cooperation and, and uh, uh, with China and Chinese investments might play still a significant role in Europe, but to develop these, to enable these politically will be much more complicated and uh, put the European side also um, into a difficult position to make uh, um, decisions about the role of China. To give one example, in the post-war, and, and I hope, Mikola, you can say more about this in a minute, uh, one of the key questions is what 
role should Chinese investment, so, so the Belt and Road and other um, uh, formats play in a post-war reconstruction in Ukraine? There are billions need to be invested um, to rebuild the country. So what is China's role in that? That's certainly something up to the Ukrainian government to decide, but the Europeans also might play a role in that, in framing that, uh, what China can do. And I think this will be a quite difficult, but a quite important debate to have. With that, back to you, Una. Thank you. Thank you, Max. And it's always refreshing to listen to you because I would have started with US-China, but you left the US-China for last and actually pointed out many other details and many other nuances here. Thank you very much. Now, Mikola, please let me turn to you for your intervention. Uh, Mikola is joining us from uh, Kyiv. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, um, by exploiting uh, my uh, interest to IR theory, I will probably concentrate on dilemmas, uh, the word which is uh, quite often used uh, in uh, describing various theoretical aspects of international politics. But before I do that, I will also point out that um, transforming international orders is difficult and costly. And that is, I, I guess, what we are observing today, just the way we observed it 100 years ago during World War I. And um, um, the rise of China, which has been speculated a lot uh, for about a couple of decades, as far as I remember, has suddenly uh, happened and um, um, made a crisis in, uh, on the global level of international politics inevitable. And that was a question before the war in Ukraine started, um, how it could look like, because everyone was uh, aware that uh, the level of mutual interdependence among major um, global players like uh, the US, uh, China, the European Union uh, has been huge. What what form a global conflict involving those major actors under such conditions could take. Uh, so currently we are um, in a way uh, looking at this experiment, uh, figuring out uh, the real balance of power on the global level, the measures of influence uh, uh, of the West uh, or the uh, power potential of those uh, countries which are challenging existing international order. And uh, the, the very fact that everybody is speaking about rule-based international order or about international order in general is also quite telling. So in my view, what is happening today in uh, Ukraine goes beyond uh, actually Ukrainian territory or uh, Eastern or Central Europe. And uh, the dimension of this conflict, which is global, which is about uh, the transition of power is extremely important. It can be addressed, by the way, speaking about IR theories by a power transition theory, which is a, an old but quite useful instrument in doing that. Uh, um, and uh, that is the way to see how uh, different difficult questions uh, are um, arising for uh, major countries involved. So when I'm uh, referring to dilemmas, um, I mean uh, those difficult questions, uh, which do not have uh, simple answers, uh, which are currently on the table of the political leaders in the in the in Europe, uh, in um, uh, large European countries, in the United States, in China, in Russia, and also in a number of countries which are um, smaller. Um, one of the key of them is uh, actually what we are supposed to talk about. What is the title of our meeting? Uh, is uh, relations between. Uh, China and the European Union, and I would also certainly agree that uh, they have been deteriorating. And um, that started to happen before, um, before Russia invaded Ukraine, because uh, there has always been a suspicion towards China's intentions. And uh, this uh, a decade-long uh, historical record of uh, Belt and Road uh, was uh, quite clear from um, economic trade and infrastructural point of view, but it was uh, uh, quite vague about uh, geopolitical consequences and what actually China means by uh, uh, enforcing this project. What are the uh, what is the grand strategy behind it? And uh, uh, these questions have not been properly answered by the Chinese government, which uh, created some place for suspicion from European side, and also for uh, some political tensions, which uh, started to emerge. Uh, 
even before Russia invaded. The Russian invasion to Ukraine uh, uh, created a dilemma for China as well. And I have been uh, uh, commenting on it and writing about it uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, pointing out that uh, um, China has found itself in a quite difficult uh, situation resulting from this war. On the one hand, uh, it cannot uh, let Russia lose in a way, cannot abandon Russia, cannot halt uh, its uh, diplomatic support for Russia, technical support, financial support, or whatever else. Uh, because Russia is the only major power who can be China's ally in its grand strategy of uh, undermining or changing the existing international order. If China doesn't have Russia besides it, it, it is alone in fighting uh, the West, which clearly uh, is a war with uh, very low chances for success for China. But on the other hand, um, it cannot uh, bring itself in line with Russia fully. Because uh, what Russia is doing is clearly violating uh, international law. It's clearly violating any principles of, uh, uh, well, um, of mutually beneficial cooperation uh, and the peaceful coexistence. All these um, ideological elements, which are essential for Chinese uh, own foreign policy, which have been put on the uh, slogans of the Belt and Road Initiative, and generally under which uh, Chinese. Uh, uh, influence uh, and Chinese power has been uh, enhanced uh, globally. So uh, uh, allying with Russia in this situation would mean uh, uh, finding itself on the wrong side of history. And this is not what China wants for its future uh, political uh, aims. So uh, uh, I fully understand the difficulties uh, Chinese government is facing, and I guess that this is an important element of political uh, uh, discussion uh, in Beijing in over the recent year. Uh, getting back to the dilemmas in uh, relations between Europe and China, I, I, get, I guess the principle of them is that um, uh, China and EU need one another as trade partners, because these are large economies, large markets, uh, and um, uh, Europe facing uh, a possible uh, uh, economic decline or uh, recession or a s probably slower uh, economic growth than other competing uh, global centers of power uh, may need Chinese markets, uh, Chinese investments and Chinese money to overcome the difficult phase. Uh, on the other hand, China also needs Europe and that need uh, appeared uh, long before the war and actually, um, the One Belt, One Road initiative, one of the major goals of this was to connect China to the huge European market. And the Eastern and the Central Europe was um, an entering gate to, to, to the European market in general. And that's, what, that's how China has been constructing its uh, infrastructure to reach that European market as, at, uh, as uh, cheaply as possible and as fastly as possible. Uh, all those um, plans or ideas which are really important for China's future are now under question. And um, because another part of the dilemma is that political, ideological or value-based uh, conflicts uh, or disputes uh, uh, have suddenly become uh, very important because the, issue, the whole issue of China in uh, global uh, security discourse has been securitized. China has become a, a threat in many ways uh, to many countries uh, and in many areas. And the strategic cooperation with China started to have uh, uh, an additional price, I would say, to it, attached to it. And uh, that was Europeans felt uh, extremely well during this year when uh, the war started. Uh, and uh, some minor uh, illustrations to that in, uh, for instance, uh, lawsuits on uh, um, uh, the trade with uh, Lithuania, for example, which has been limited by the Chinese uh, government uh, or the intellectual property rights or something like that are only minor illustrations to the, to the, the, the whole crisis of uh, bilateral relations between China and Europe, as well as uh, the uh, demise of uh, the 17 plus one project, uh, which also started not uh, uh, not uh, not so recently. So um, this is dilemma for both countries, and uh, 
in my view, the attempts which have been made by uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, for instance, or Joseph Borrell uh, commenting on the future of uh, relations with China uh, are reflecting a little bit that difficulties, uh, indicating that Europe uh, does understand that it needs China as a trading partner uh, and that the level of interdependence is quite high. But on the other hand, Europe is also aware that uh, this and interdependence can do harm just the way that interdependence with Russia on energy issues was doing harm to European economies and European political and security interests. I think that there is no ready answer to, to that kind of dilemma so far. Uh, relations with China is also uh, an, a, a, an important and difficult question for the Russians, uh, because uh, apparently um, Russia has paid for a, an ill-prepared war against Ukraine uh, for a mistaken um, political decision by growing uh, dependence on China in, in many ways. Uh, Russia is uh, needing China's support in, in a number of uh, areas. And um, the recent visit to China by, by the former Russian President Medvedev was also uh, indicating that. But um, at the same time, uh, I think that uh, Russian leadership does understand that the price for Chinese support will be rising in the future as long as the war continues. And that the enthusiasm from the Chinese uh, uh, side to support Russia in that war will be decreasing because no matter how important politically relations with Russia may be, and Chinese are referring to those as the partnership without border, borders, but uh, this war uh, clearly shows those borders to this partnership. And it also indicates that uh, um, in the long run, uh, well-managed uh, well and constructive uh, relations of cooperation with Europe, uh, which is a huge economy, much bigger than that of Russia, are more important for China than uh, relations with, uh, with Russia. And uh, our concerns are rising in uh, Beijing about uh, how this war is handled and the remarks about the nuclear weapons and threats of nuclear weapons, which have been issued by, uh, by Moscow, have also been taken critically by, by, by China. Uh, so uh, that is a problem for Russia, I guess. Uh, and um, this partnership with China is uh, not looking as good uh, for Russia as it was uh, a year ago before the war. Uh, it is uh, much more asymmetrical, not in Russia's favor, and it has very unclear perspectives. One more dilemma is about um, uh, relations between uh, China and the United States. If we are uh, in the world, in the, in the world which is under transformation, in the um, uh, epicenter of the fight for the new international order, then it will be critical how the two largest and most powerful countries will manage to build relations between themselves. Um, so um, getting back to my words about uh, difficulties in uh, changing international orders under conditions of interdependence, this is what the United States and China are facing today. The task to manage this conflict, to somehow uh, limit uh, the level of escalation and uh, also to minimize risks uh, is mutually important. I think this is something which uh, both, uh, which concerns both uh, uh, Chinese and American leadership. Uh, and this is also a, a huge dilemma, which uh, uh, also will heavily dependent on how uh, the war uh, uh, against uh, Russia's war against Ukraine is developing. I will also shortly comment about um, Ukraine's relations with China which was an interesting case because um, uh, we have uh, traditionally been facing also a dilemma in Ukraine's foreign policy. On the one hand, uh, China has become Ukraine's number one trading partner uh, instead of Russia. Uh, after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, Russia's role has been declining steadily and China's role has been growing. And a couple of years ago, China has turned uh, uh, Ukraine's biggest trading partner. And um, um, there was seemed that there are no uh, principal disagreements or conflicts of interest between Ukraine and China, apart from China being an ally of Russia. But uh, somehow um, there were hopes in Kiev that, that that can be overcome in a way, and that there will be a, a, a place for uh, a strategic partnership between Ukraine and China. There were several projects, all they have been quite small um, uh, comparing to other neighboring countries. Uh, 
uh, in which China have been, uh, in, has been investing uh, money in the infrastructure project, first of all, in Ukraine. China was interested in uh, the Motor Siege uh, company, which uh, is producing uh, engines for helicopters and planes, uh, military equipment, uh, something which has been, or even, it has even invested money into that, trying to buy um, uh, a share of the company, but uh, this deal has been blocked by, the, uh, by Ukraine's special service. Uh, so uh, there was some kind of an agenda of bilateral relations, and there were hopes that uh, as soon as Ukraine gets its uh, ambassador in Beijing, there will be some uh, movement forward. Uh, but um, on the other hand, it was clearly clear that uh, there, there are uh, ideological inconsistencies and also political inconsistencies. And Ukraine in its uh, relations with China has been uh, quite dependent on the more general context of the climate of European Chinese relations, which has been deteriorating. And that dilemma remained unresolved. And when the war started, it has created a completely different setting for Ukrainian Chinese relations. And now uh, there are much few people among Ukrainian decision makers and politicians who believe that there is any kind of potential of constructive relations with, uh, uh, with China in the future. Uh, so summing it up, I would say that um, when we are dealing with China and uh, uh, the development of relations which are involving China and other major um, powers uh, in the world, um, the way to, the, the instruments to control possible escalation uh, are quite principal in the future. It is clear that the, the political and ideological insecurity um, Disputes uh, or conflicts of interests which are present today will not disappear in the future. Most likely, they will be as some form of conflict involving China and uh, uh, major Western and not only Western powers. And uh, it is important to uh, control the level of those tensions uh, to somehow move through this transitional period to a slightly new a security of an architecture uh, in, on the international level. Uh, uh, second, the uh, grand strategy of the West will be essential because this war has provided the West with a new chance for leadership, for, for, uh, for, uh, for um, unification. Uh, and um, uh, it has also put China in quite a uh, difficult position. So the way the West would uh, play this card out will be important also for how future uh, security will look like. And the results of the war, which is currently underway, are also essential. Actually, probably th this is the most important uh, factor, which is still unknown. There are lots of speculations about how this war can uh, develop and how it can end. I'm uh, on a, a skeptical uh, part of this spectrum, and I think that uh, uh, this is going to last for some time. This is going to be a protracted long-term conflict, and uh, uh, many things can happen before it uh, comes to an end. And because of that, uh, being cautious and uh, being able to manage uh, to turn as much as possible of lost-lost scenarios to win-win scenarios uh, is uh, a necessity for all parties involved. Um, thank you. Thank you. Excellent remarks. And any question I had during your intervention, you answered at a later stage. So let me just turn to the questions that we have coming in from the audience. And the first question, I think um, we, we, should, we should kind of ask Max to respond. Um, again, a very future-oriented question and a complicated one. But here goes. What role could China play concerning the special tribunal development to punish Russian war crimes in Ukraine? Are there interest in cooperation with wider EU or CEE? Is it enough to weigh out the current neutral policy? So just feel free to take those keywords and play with them. Yeah, uh, happy to. Uh, that's, uh, that's a hard one. I, I think the Chinese side has no interest and no plans whatsoever to be integrated or to play some role in a future uh, tri tribunal. So I think that's just off off the cards. That's not there, this possibility. Um, I think there need to be other ways to, uh, and we have to think, talking about a grand strategy, right, especially from a European point of view, how to integrate China into post-war scenarios. 
both for uh, investment, uh, infrastructure rebuilding, but on the level of international law, I don't see uh, China can play a role. And I wouldn't even, I mean, I think the European diplomats are already transporting that message that something like that might be coming. But given the close uh, strategic cooperation and like Mikola has described this dilemma China is in, um, uh, China won't go in that direction to be part of this of this tribunal, especially also because you always have that rhetoric in China, and by the way, also in other countries, that if there is a tribunal for Russia um, and for war crimes, then where is the tribunal for what the U.S. did in Iraq and 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 and, and elsewhere? Right. So they, they have this. They they put these two conflicts on the same level and say the West is totally hypocritical in uh, only want to have only uh, wanting to have a tribunal for Russia. But what about what Western countries, especially the U.S., did in Iraq? So you have always this discussion. Based on that discussion, uh, I don't see any participation of the Chinese uh, side in in a tribunal. Indeed, and so the the EU leadership refrain on, uh, you know, inviting China to take a more active anti-Russia role is just maybe a feel-good agenda point that has to be in a document and not much else. Thank you. Now a question for Mikola, um, and that actually goes back to the question that. Um, Maximilian asked in his remarks, and um, something that you already tackled, but still, um, on what conditions would you say China could participate in the reconstruction processes of Ukraine? And another, given the dilemmas that you outlined, another way to look at this is, would it even be in EU's interest considering and supporting China's China's role in 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 Europe in wider Europe and in in a, in, in a European uh, candidate state uh, I'm usually um, very cautious about talking uh, um, of Ukraine's reconstruction after the war because I believe it's still a very long way to go before that war ends and before before we understand uh, the scale of uh, resources needed and uh, what kind of uh, what 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 scale of a problem we will be facing uh, many would say in ukraine and many are saying about the new marshall plan or something like that about the west uh, creating special funds and uh, pouring money into ukraine after the war but i believe that it will be very dependent on the political conditions under which uh, the war is over on the place Ukraine will have uh, in the future architecture of security in Europe. For instance, if Ukraine would uh, end up as a, an EU member or as a member of NATO, that will be one kind of uh, situation uh, under which I guess that the lion's share of uh, reconstruction funds will come uh, from the Western countries uh, and uh, there will be a very little place for Chinese uh, money here. Uh, another story will be if Ukraine end up, ends up in a, some sort of uh, a neutral country with uh, guarantees, security guarantees from some states, uh, including China, quite possibly. I think that uh, China can be a, a guarantor of Ukraine's security. But uh, I'm afraid that if that happens, that would mean that the conditions uh, for, for the, uh, the, the end of the war are not very much in Ukraine's favor. Um, the main um, um, thing about uh, Chinese money in Ukraine generally before the war, and I believe the same will be after the war, was uh, uh, political conditions. And many people in Ukraine has been, have been afraid that China is providing money in exchange for, uh, uh, for quite severe political conditions under quite strict uh, uh, supervision and involvement, in the, including Chinese lobbying and internal political uh, developments in, in, in certain countries. Uh, so I think that's the, the most important thing Ukraine will uh, uh, try to avoid. And um, uh, I am not sure that the Chinese will uh, uh, agree to provide enough investment or enough money for reconstruction in Ukraine without uh, pursuing their political and geopolitical interests. Uh, and uh, that would be most likely unacceptable, unacceptable for Ukraine. But uh, anyway, I will once again uh, say that uh, uh, mostly that would develop, uh, depend on how the war is, uh, on how war, or the war ends. 
Exactly. Thank you. And um, I have another question here for you, which brings us back to Latvia. Um, and the question goes, in, in recent years in Latvia, we have heard much about cooperation between like-minded countries, right? That's a part of an international discourse of like-mindedness. So the question to you, Mikola, is what does like-mindedness mean to Ukraine today? And does China fit somewhere in there or not? Uh, well, uh, this is also an interesting question from the point of view of our, our, our theory, because uh, words like uh, friendship, for instance, or, or, or um, hatred, uh, uh, they do not mean much for a realist. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they mean much in an everyday political decision making. So even those people who are uh, uh, who, who think that they are realists and try to uh, figure out uh, um, uh, gains and risks and calculate everything and see no uh, um, way to use these concepts in their decision making. They 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 are relying on this and what states how they how states perceive each other uh, really matters. Now because of that, um, I was I, I think that uh, the issue of uh, common norms, values, ideologies uh, is certainly important. And uh, I do hope that uh, Ukraine, uh, which uh, for quite uh, a long period of its three decades history has been uh, emulating some of these uh, issues and has been speculating on them, uh, will uh, really bring itself much closer to, to, to Western, to, to, to liberal values, uh, to norms of democracy and all this. Uh, uh, connected uh, issues. And uh, this, I believe, will uh, take it pretty far from the Chinese uh, ideological perspective, which is primarily uh, focused on, uh, chain, on, on, the, on the communism with Chinese specifications, on this uh, grand theory, which has been the, um, uh, modified by, uh, by the current Chinese president, uh, and which is the basis for everything, including the foreign policy. So that the Chinese, uh, uh, in order to become China's friend, you have to share the Chinese perspective on uh, uh, on international politics, which is quite uh, neo-Marxist, I would say. This is fighting for uh, the interests of the third world and against injustice and international order, against structural violence and all this stuff. Uh, um, even if you uh, subscribe to this kind of vision, uh, you can become uh, friends uh, uh, with, uh, with China. But I think that Ukraine does not have, uh, uh, does not have uh, a chance to do it uh, because it, has, it is completely, first of all, it is uh, um, completely against of, uh, uh, what most of Ukrainians have been thinking uh, about the future of their own country in recent uh, uh, nine years. And... Um, Second of all, uh, it makes it is now a matter of uh, uh, a choice for the future of Ukraine's national security. If Ukraine wants uh, credible security guarantees from the West, if it wants uh, at the best NATO membership, then uh, um, the choice is clear. Thank you. And it sounds like the choice is even closer to the Baltics. And uh, that um, uh, is another thing that we share. Una, can, so, I add something? can I add something to that? The question is going your way anyway, so please add and then I will read the question. So um, I think I agree with Mikula here, um, um, but there, I mean, let's add a couple of other issues here, right? So for example, value-wise, yes, the ideologies are very diff uh, different. However, you could say on a more strategic level, one of the things where the West and China agrees, and, and China is not in the Russian camp, is obviously deterrence, nuclear deterrence, and the use of nuclear weapons. So that has been made quite clear during the visit of uh, Chancellor Schultz and later in talks between President Xi and, and President Biden that China doesn't in any way agree with Russia threatening to use nuclear weapons. So I think this is very important. There we still have the same kind of norms, right, in, in a way. And, and I think that's important, especially because uh, as uh, as was already mentioned, we are in a very turbulent phase of reordering and also remaking of the world order. Still, some of the basic norms, for example, related to nuclear deterrence, uh, we agree on with China. The other element of that transition is certainly a trust problem. So the, there is a growing mistrust 
So the whole language of friendship and 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 partnerships and so forth is perhaps a bit painting over the reality that even among allies, even among uh, uh, countries and governments which share basically the same values, even there trust is is running low, right? And trust issues are emerging. Uh, just look at, at uh, German relations with other European countries in terms of trust, right? So. Trust, mistrust, and the growing mistrust, I think, is just a reality for diplomats and for governments. And that's also something we have to deal with, aside from the value issues and from the issues of shared norms. Thank you. And so let me go back to the question. Um, uh, th this is the, the, the last question, which is connected to our topic today, but then we're going to have, because Max very readily outlined that, you know, that the issue of, of German politics is always something that's interesting, especially as one of the comments goes, when we have excellent German and Ukrainian represent representatives at the panel. So let me finish um, with the, the, the on-topic question and then we move to the last wider remarks. So Max, something that Khan was also outlined in his remarks, China's and Russia's cooperation in regions outside Europe. For example, we've been hearing about China, uh, uh, China, in, uh, China and Russia in Africa. Is there any cooperation? And what does it mean for Western values, uh, something you took a stab at just now, and security? Yeah, that's that's a good one, and and I think very complicated picture there. So, basically, the two China and Russia as actors uh, in the global south and different regions have quite different profiles, right? Russia is still uh, and and will remain focused on the security level. You have uh, uh, private security forces there, and you have very strong defense kind of element, right? And then China is much more on the side of infrastructure building, uh, uh, investment, so it's much more economically, even so, of course, China has also a military component. Don't forget, uh, uh, Chinese troops are providing a huge share of um, United Nations missions and, and, and personal and so forth. And China is also selling a lot of weapons, but it's still quite economically focused. And therefore, the overlap between both of them is not quite big. Plus, even China perceives Russian activities in some regions, for example, in Northern Africa, as not a stabilizing force, as more a destabilizing element. And I think the key there is that, and that's going back to Mikola's uh, dilemmata he was describing, I think, um, ch Russian activities, not just in Ukraine, but also in Syria and elsewhere, are seriously um, hindering and are seriously damaging the success potential of the Belt and Road. And, and since the Belt and Road used to be the major uh, foreign policy project, China was following its closest partner, strategic ally Russia, or not ally, or partner, uh, is working against these goals. And th this is, of course, a, a massive dilemma, right? So, uh, and, and therefore, you don't see a lot of direct and close uh, alignment or even uh, cooperation in different regions. Uh, take the Middle East as another example. Uh, China has been very active in the Middle East, and that's independent of the Russian uh, uh, Russian initiatives there and, and, and Russian agenda there. Um, so China tries to develop its own uh, relations with different global regions, and Russia doesn't play a big role there. And I think because of this dilemma that we have been talking, that's not going to change. Thank you. I would just add that in the information space, maybe there's something to be flagged, but of course, uh, I completely agree with you on hard security. Now to this last question, which is way wider than our topic, but which is extremely important and timely, I believe. What would both experts say about military support to Ukraine? How do experts see and explain the German position and yesterday's decision? <laughs> Mikola, let's start with you. Uh. <laughs> Well, there was certainly huge enthusiasm among Ukrainians yesterday when the, uh, the transfer of tanks has been announced both by Germany and the United States, uh, which uh, takes the war into the next phase and uh, increases the chances certainly for Ukraine's uh, resistance. Uh, however, I would say that um, I used to develop a quite strict position on uh, a, a quite strict enthusiasm about um, um, about the war going to the next level, let's put it like this, because I do understand the risks. And uh, 
Um, I know that we have actually no choice but to continue fighting, but the, uh, the Russians are still, uh, in my view, controlling the levels of escalation, and they are responding to any kind of this additional supplies by, uh, by uh, mobilization, new missile strikes, uh, and uh, increased uh, threats uh, in, in terms of rhetoric, and uh, all other possible ways. Uh, so, um, uh, as a country which uh, has no other choice but to continue fighting, I certainly welcome uh, uh, any support, and I think that is pretty relevant and it's quite important. During this year, financial, uh, I mean, military support from the West uh, allowed us almost to equal the Russian military budget. So before the war, we had uh, 10 times less money spent for military than Russians which made uh, the conflict hugely asymmetric. Today, uh, the amounts of the Western support uh, is almost equal to Russia's uh, uh, military budget, at least it is, has been in, uh, in 2021. Uh, so this is a, a huge, a really huge level of support and it's uh, uh, responsive. I would say that, that this is a support which is dependent on how the war is going. In the beginning, it was um, anti-tank missiles or singers or things like that. Now it's about um, supplying artillery uh, and the tanks and the talks also about uh, future supplies of uh, fighters are also underway. So um, this is a certainly a positive sign. But uh, at the same time, um, uh, I'm not expecting uh, quick victories, probably unlike most Ukrainians, uh, who may imagine that these tanks are used in the, in the Ukrainian offensive uh, somewhere in the steppes of southern Ukraine in the recent uh, in in the in the nearest months? But I, I do understand that this war is uh, going to last for some time, and um, Russia can respond to each of these supplies with uh, uh, equal amount of uh, uh, escalation. However, Russia's resources are certainly not infinite, and uh, sooner or later uh, um, this will uh, have an effect. Thank you. Uh, let us hope for sooner rather than later. And Max, to you for concluding remarks on this and any other topic you'd like to conclude with. No, I just stick with that topic. I think that's too important and really one of the crucial uh, questions coming uh, from the audience. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm very much in favor of that uh, support and I feel embarrassed that it took Germany so long to make and the German government to make this decision. Of course, Mikula is right, there are risks and, and there needs to be a careful consideration what this, how this impacts uh, German and European security as well. And Germany has always tried to stay in close cooperation and in close um, alignment with, this, with the decisions made in, in Washington. And, and this is reflected in this, in this very late uh, kind of change of, of mind or uh, change of strategy. However, um, I wouldn't over, overestimate the current decision taken. Why? A, we are not talking about a lot of tanks. Right. We are just talking about maybe maybe 80, maybe 100 tanks. We don't know when they will be delivered. According to the Ukrainian government, at least 300 would be needed. Um, um, I would be even more uh, uh, conservative and would say, well, maybe 500 would be good. Uh, so this is by far not enough what is decided now to be delivered, and we don't know when exactly it will be delivered. And second, I think we need a long-term perspective. I agree with Mikola. It's unfortunate, but this war might long much long might, might last much longer. So the, the Russian willingness to go in and to mobilize more and to bring in more resources is certainly evident. Uh, and therefore, the, one of the key questions is how much, how, how stable will be the public support in, in Western countries to deliver more? Because in, in, a, in, in a month, in a year from now, we're not just talking about more tanks, we are talking about all kinds of weapon systems and the need for European countries, for the US to ramp up their um, uh, production of, of, of all kinds of military goods and to ramp up their arsenal. And that kind of fundamental shift hasn't been decided yet. That's not decided whether we really ramp up the production capacities in Germany and other countries, for example. And I think this is linked to another issue for in, in Berlin and in Washington, at least publicly, it's not been decided what's the ultimate goal, what's the ultimate strategic goal of this 
of this war. And, and since this has not been decided, I think um, there, 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 many things are totally open. How long this support will last, how much more weapons will be delivered, how big are the risks uh, which are accepted, for example, in Berlin, based on these decisions, this is this is wide open. And therefore, I think we moved into a new phase with this decision to deliver these tanks and have a joint initiative to deliver these tanks together. But this is just the beginning of a phase in the war where we will likely see a much bigger military escalation. And we will also see Russian responses towards that uh, delivery of arsenal and of weapons. Um, and in, in some ways, of course, this means also that the, the Europeans have decided by supporting Ukraine with more material, we will also make the likelihood that this war is going on for longer a reality. And, and now the strategic question is, of course, how much more weapons we're going to deliver to make sure that in this new phase of the war, uh, Ukraine is getting the upper hand and is achieving some of its more tactical goals for the moment without knowing exactly where we're going to be in the end, right? Thank you. Um, and um, I would like to thank our audience as well for making my job a lot easier with your excellent questions. From Bonn to Kiev to Riga, uh, we discussed interrupted connectivity, all sorts of interrupted connectivity, uh, but with um, a hope for a brighter future um, and the days to come. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Professor Meyer. Thank you, Professor Kapitankov.